The remaining windows rattle from a strong gust of wind. They're covered in a thick layer of grime. They must have been like this for 40 years. Dripping water falls from a high place. All you can see is the shadow of a collapsing staircase. There's rust and corrosion on the bars. They're foaming with it. And a small layer of white salt from the sea. Lieutenant, can you make out what's inside? No. I won't even try. You know, I had a partner once. They called him Eyes because he had to show me things. It's that bad. This partner of his, Eyes, things didn't end well. It saddens him to say his name. Don't even ask. He wouldn't answer. Maybe some other small talk. Can you still shoot though? Well enough actually. It's odd how that works. I'm no sharpshooter, but I pass my shooting courses 7 out of 10. His hands lead the way when it comes to that. And his shoulders. It's reflex. And Mikael noticed the windows. Especially with how there are no windows on the south side. This was to deal with. You officers, come to investigate the historic subtext of West Martinez? I'm Tran Heilostown. You must be Kim Kitsuragi, right? I was just telling my son about this building. Not a lot of people realize the historic significance here. Very rich in hypertext. Nice to meet you. Hold on. Hypertext? Yes, hypertext. Young Carp and the collection of cultural hyperlinks. He's just making up fancy words. This doesn't mean anything. Wait, what was that about the windows before? Oh yes, so Mikhail. They had to deal with monitor glare, especially in the summer. They still had vector monitors back then. That was 49 years ago. So they didn't have windows on the south wall. You and Kim know each other? No, I can't say that we've met before. But I've heard of Kim, of course. Mikhail, say hi to the officers. Mikhail's a little tired today. We spent all night trying to run Orbis on his radio computer. Have you heard of it? It's a programming language used in Grad. Quite tricky, but he wanted to play this Grad-made adventure program. We've been getting really into worms lately. The man speaks in the artificial cadence of a professor. Or someone who's been on too many radio shows. But I assume you're not here for giant worms when there are so many real things to see. Just as I was telling Mikhail before, this is where the Coalition landed in 08. We could be standing on what is the most interesting landmark in Revachol West. This man is your half-brother. You feel it. But why? Well, get a load of this guy. He really enjoys his trivia. The Orbis programming language was named after its inventor, Victor Orbis, a cybernetician from Grad. They run Vox in the Occidental countries. What's so fascinating about an empty old building? Aha, but it's not just any empty old building. What not a lot of people know is, this used to be the R&D department of Felt Electrical. And Felt, which now sells ink cartridges mostly, was once a top dog in the turn of the century cybernetics boom. It looks old and weathered with seagulls picking apart its stone and metal carcass. Bushy undergrowth has taken hold of the collapsed rooftop. Some kind of bird has set up a nest on a broken windowsill. I don't think I ever heard of this field electrical. That's not surprising. Only a vestigial ink cartridge and ferrotape manufacturer remains. They started out as a midway electronics outfit in Königstein two centuries ago. After an aggressive move to Revachol, Feld became a global player in the emerging personal electronics market of the pre-revolutionary era. Still, Tricentennial was beating them in business machines. But Feld had an ace up their sleeve. Or should I say, they were developing an ace up their sleeve. I'm mixing my metaphors here. What was that ace? It was here in Martinez, possibly in this very building. 
that they developed prototypes for a tape computer. A tape computer? Mm -hmm. An elegant folding mechanism of rollers and ferrotape ribbons, portable enough to be a take-it-home solution. Revolutionizing business machines, possibly even bring them to the average consumer. Which is a feat of engineering even today's giants, Rain, ICN and Zam, haven't achieved yet. He assumes something like a combat stance, facing the wind. What happened? Indeed. What? The revolution! Unfortunately, their moonshot project never made it to the market. Feld's move to Revachol backfired. The revolutionary government liquefied their assets and expropriated those very advanced prototypes. Possibly from this very building, or one of the adjacent ruins. All of this was built by Feld, even a boardwalk. While Pines built Martinez proper as a resort for their middle management, Feld built this side of town for R&D. You're saying that Feld Electrical built this boardwalk? Yes, they even built a pleasure wheel, but that got destroyed in the war. A pleasure wheel? Perhaps reminded of a childhood memory. It's clear he would prefer there were a big wheel lighting up the coast. Yes, to lure in their star engineers. This part of Martinez was nothing but reeds before it felt arrived. They had to make the prospect of living here attractive. It was supposed to become a global center for innovation in cybernetics. But history had other plans. What happened to the engineers? The company people? Oh, I'm afraid it didn't end well for the boys. But this story is a bit too dark for little Mikael here. Now, if you were to ask about tape computers... He means that the boys got shot by the communists. The boys were bourgeois. He means they all got shot in the head because they were bourgeois. Now, do you know what the bourgeoisie is? is? Officer, I told you this chapter of history wasn't on Mikhail's curriculum yet. Let's keep this kid friendly. The boy looks first at you. Then, back at his father, confused. What did the revolutionaries do with those advanced tape computers? They used them for military communications, but also to write and send out press releases. The most notorious example being Le Decret de Mars. Where was that? What's the Mars Decree? I mean the radio transmission sent out to news agencies and world governments by the newly created Commune of Revachol on the 7th of March in the year 02. A short-lived legislative foundation for a short-lived utopia. It's a beautiful piece of text, actually. A singer-songwriter I know, Charette, called it a love poem to River Shawl on her political concept album, Bon Bessier dans le Lind. You should read it. Every local library in River Shawl stocks a copy of the decree. I tried to get Mikhail to memorize it. Tried to. Someone was much too interested in worms to be paying any attention. The kid takes a peek at the green and silver worm on the cover of the book, already forgetting about this part of the discussion. How did those tape computers work? Actually, no one knows. No one even knows what a computer made entirely of tape would look like. But word has it, they were very elegant, exquisite, alien-looking, turn-of-the-century hardware. Buckle up. Ten years ago, I did a little... Freelancing, I guess you could say. I was a special consultant for an exhibition at the Womti Domti Dom Center in Vredeport, Oranje. It raised the same questions, and we had lengthy discussions with Paul Ockerman, who was head curator at the time. This was before the twins Keith and Guy Jews joined the team, trying to... Wait, did he just say Womti Domti Dom Center? He did it. He said Womti Domti Dom Center. Like it's the most natural thing in the world. What the hell is a Wompty Dompty Dom Center? And who the hell are Keith and Guy Yost? This is all ninzy pinzy garbage for sissy people. Okay. The Wompty Dompty Dom Center? Paul Ockerman? Kent and Guy Yost? What are you talking about? The Wompty Dompty Dom Center for Contemporary Arts. The exhibition itself drew on Lagerman's notion of memory, and so there were some parallels. That's why the head curator, Paul Ockerman, chose to... 
You're making this up. Kim, is he making this up? In fact, I'm not. The Wompty Dompty Dom Center is a place you can visit if you're ever in Vredeport and are ever in the market for an exhibition space slash contemporary art research center. <clears throat> but perhaps I should return to the tape computers. As I was saying, the device itself was very elegant, fragile even. One could write directly on the tape using a special chemical solution. The machine would then analyze the handwriting, perform operations and project output onto a white screen. It was a beautiful, delicate thing. Made of black film and folding tape structures. Cool. Very, very cool. Though I understand the socio-economic causes of the revolution, it pains me to imagine the revolutionary setting fire to this precious device. But so they did. The felt playback experiment vanished into the fires of 07. Wait, the felt playback experiment? Yes, the official name of the prototype. Some sources report it as the felt playback experience, but those are incorrect. Why did the revolutionaries destroy it? Who knows? Maybe it was an accident, or maybe they didn't want the technology to end up in the wrong hands. Either way, they're all gone now. All three versions of the prototype. Nothing but debris and ashes remain inside that building. Two seagulls circle in the sky. You look up and think, really? Or was there a fourth prototype that remains hidden in the mausoleums below Cold City? I want to ask something else. But of course, <laughs> what else? You look like someone who has money. Do you have any money? I do have some money, yes, but that's not what's really important here. He's not gonna give you money. What are you doing? Clearly you were just profiling. No, I mean, come on, you need the money. If it's not a thing, he can give you some. Can I have some of that unimportant money then? Oh no, I don't have it on me, officer. I was talking in more general terms. I'm just spending time with my kid here, showing him around the lesser known parts of our hometown. It wouldn't be wise to carry huge amounts of cash on such expeditions. Not that he would have to worry about being robbed. He looks surprisingly buff. Does he work out? By the way, do you work out? I do some Lomantang stick fighting now and then. Lomantang stick fighting is a form of martial arts originating from the island of Lomantang. It uses slender wooden sticks for confronting the opponent. A form of martial arts from the Isle of Lomantan, right? Actually, a great many cultures have their own version of stick fighting, such as the sacred Mabolo tradition of the Harley people, a name deriving from the butterfruit tree traditionally used for crafting the long slender sticks, whereas the sticks used in other cultures... You doze off as he paints you a comprehensive picture of the history of stick fighting among mankind, seasoning it with unexpected pop culture references. Man, he's good at speaking. People must love him. But anyway, I'm boring you with details again. You were saying? I'm not really interested in the practice. I just want to know how often you work out. Now and then, that's what, like once a week? Lomantang stick fighting is a little like a Berolidin addiction. I've been practicing it for nearly 20 years now, so you could say that my doses have grown a little peculiar. Wait, what does this man know about Berolidin addiction? Hold on. Berolidin addiction? What an interesting metaphor. Or perhaps not a metaphor at all. <laughs> you got me, detective. But my history should hardly come as a surprise. Here's a former junkie. I can recognize one when I see it. Dad's fighting with sticks every night after dinner for four hours. He has a special room for that and a special costume. That's right, Mikhail. It also has a meditative quality. Helps to clear my head. But anyway. Great. Thank you for all the interesting information. No, thanks to you for having me and little Mikhail here to pick your brain. A very interesting conversation indeed. Pick your brain. If anything, this was rather one-sided. He did the talking. Whatever. You see?
see a once bright mural towering above you. The signage has peeled off over the years, but you can still make out Feld Electrical R&D. A slogan used to intertwine with the loops a long time ago. Now, only a shadow of peeled letters remains. It says, tomorrow is just a whisper away. Tomorrow is just a whisper away. Looks like tomorrow never came. Someone has left an unidentifiable article of clothing on this railing. It smells really bad. The cloth, if you can still call it that, makes a soft crunching sound as you thrust your finger into it. It's streaked with dried seagull shit and tangled with pieces of seaweed. A dangling arm suggests that there might be a jacket beneath the crust of filth. It seems likely that it was left in the surf until someone laid it out on this fence to dry out. Unfortunately, that just seems to have stiffened it into a shapeless mass. Please, tell me you're not taking that with you. I think this is the jacket the idiot Doom Spiral guy wants to find. I'm sure he'll be thrilled to have it returned. That is awful. It doesn't help. You can still smell it. Keep it in now. Don't overreact. Breathe. What is it? Don't you recognize it? That idiot's pungency. That faintly cloying sweetness. Only death smells like that. Something cold wakes in the pit of your stomach. Fear. It is death. It must be. Heads up, Lieutenant. Something's not right here. The Lieutenant has already brought a handkerchief to his nose. A man lies on the boardwalk, his limbs bent and neck turned at an unnatural angle. Right next to him is an empty bottle of spirits. In his cramped hand, a chewing gum wrapper. Half of his body has slipped between the cracked boardwalk, starting with the left leg. The fall has left him broken, contorted like a sad puppet. The smell is not as bad as a two-week-old corpse, but it's definitely heading there. Hold on. Lividity is faintly pronounced. Whoever this is has been dead for two days, no longer. We need to investigate. Another dead body. This is your job. Steal yourself. Calm now. Carefully. Just another day. Just another dead body. Breathe. He's wearing mud caked boots, beige trousers, and an old brown leather jacket with a bright blue lining. There are traces of kebab sauce on his chest. The leather jacket suits him well. It must be custom made. You find some sunflower seeds and a rain-soaked library car folded into two. His jacket feels sodden and heavy under your hand. Good. We should take a look at that library card after this is done. The man has fallen through a crack in the boardwalk and hit his head against the metal bench. Coagulated blood covers his black hair. One of his feet is still dangling through the hole. You have to be quite inebriated to fall that bad. Well over a litre of pure ethanol. Three bottles of wine or one and a half of spirits. Or maybe it was just dark. 
When damp, these boards are really slippery. Even a sober man could lose their balance here. His expression is dull, like the sea behind him. Drops of water shining on his moustache. His eyes, empty and wide, look frightening in their frozen gaze. Height, 170 to 175 centimeters. Curly hair, stout build, age approximately 50 to 60 years. He was confused when he died. Confused and alone, most likely. Overcome with the awful surprise of it all. He was just about to head home. The first step back home proved to be his last. That's what the chewing gum seems to point to as well. There's some dried blood on the metal bench, right where the corpse's head rests. The floorboards are rotten and slippery wet around the hole. An empty bottle lies nearby. A chewing gum wrapper is clutched in his fist. Be very, very careful where you step here. A dried chunk of blood covers the hair at the back of his head. An open wound. It's sticky and cold to your touch. This is what killed him. This is where he came out of himself, drop by drop, when he was unconscious. It took three, maybe four minutes. I don't see any other major wounds, do you? No, just this one at the back of his head. Seems like the head wound was fatal. It's exactly the shape of the bench. The boards screech under the weight of the T-500 ceramic sabatons. It's a good thing they're so light, because it's hard to determine whether it was the dead man's weight that caused the boardwalk to break. It definitely looks fragile. You see waves churning below. Something cracks beneath your feet. He could have easily disappeared into the sea through that hole, and you would have never found him. A 0.75 liter Tallulah vodka with its cap missing. There's hardly anything left inside. It's mid-market spirits with a slight touch of menthol. The man meant to enjoy himself, have a good time. Tear all around us. Rubowski spearmint chewing gum. Green leaves on the cover. The man's mouth is half agape from the terror of the fall. The blackness of death. Stench. You think you see white chewing gum too? Confirmed. Nearly the whole pack is there. Solidified on his lower rear teeth. He ate the whole pack, right? It's to cover the smell of alcohol before going home. The worst thing is... I've seen it before. Almost the same scenario. Even the chewing gum. It's always the same. In a ditch off a road below the 881, he thinks, a young father. Then he shakes his head to make the memory stop. The entire boardwalk creaks in the wind as you take a step back. Who is this man? Looks like one of the locals. He'd have to know this spot to come here. You don't just walk over here. But that's just a lazy assumption. What do you think? At least this man knew how to party. Imagine the same scene without the bottle. Now that would be just sad. This is an omen, a sign from above. Don't start drinking again. What we're witnessing here is a demise of a great party beast. That leather jacket, an empty vodka bottle. The wedding ring. But let's try to not run ahead. For now, all we know is that he's an unidentified middle-aged man found dead on the Martinez boardwalk. What do you think happened here? Death by misadventure. He slipped and fell through the boardwalk. A truly unfortunate accident. If it wouldn't have been for that bench, he'd be alive. So what about the kebab? What about it? The deceased ate some kebab. It's probably from a nearby place, maybe in the box. Sometimes a kebab is just a kebab. Could it be related to the lynching? No, I don't see anything that points in that direction. For now, let's treat this case as a simple, albeit sad, accident, and related to the murder case. 
Yes, but what if there's a killer on the loose? Two suspicious deaths in such a short time frame. We should consider the possibility that we're dealing with a sequence killer here. A sequence killer? There's nothing that connects those two bodies. This is a completely different case. An accident. What if all of this is staged? He could have seen something that night in the yard. What if you witnessed something? All of this could be staged. We don't know the exact cause of death. It's possible, but let's take it step by step. We still haven't identified the man. You think he was drunk? Oh, yes. What about alcohol poisoning and liver failure? Some symptoms of acute alcohol poisoning could have definitely played a role here. Severe confusion, respiratory depression, unpredictable behavior. But I think that death arrived through head trauma, not liver failure. Someone should be held responsible for this broken boardwalk. It's dangerous. They'll seal this place off after the news reaches the coalition officials. I doubt that they have enough resources to actually repair the boardwalk. Not that sealing it off would keep anyone away. All it does is keep the city council's hands clean. Right. It does seem to be a pretty straightforward misadventure. Although there's still a question of identifying the body. What should we do with him? From where I stand, I can see two options. We either take the case and follow the leads to identify the body on our own. Or we report back to the station and leave this for our colleagues to handle. Hold on, what about field autopsy? A field autopsy isn't necessary if the cause of death doesn't appear to be criminal. And this looks like a simple accident to me. I'd say we should just write down head trauma in the autopsy report and leave it at that. It would save us at least two hours of unnecessary work. Yes, but isn't that kind of sloppy? Maybe, but we don't really have much time or resources to spare. The guys at processing will take care of the rest. We found him. We should finish this. All right. We should first examine the library card you found. Then we can call the station from my kinema. Let them know we are taking the case. The library card is folded into two and still slightly wet to the touch. The front side reads, Central General Public Library Card, issued to Billy Mejean, expires July 53. Billy is a unisex name. Could be the deceased, or his family member. Whoever owns this card is an avid reader. You find a list of books written in blue pencil. Radio thriller. Stand a little less between me and the sun. The last one in the list is The Glinton Curve by M. Theobald. A library stamp indicates that the book has been returned. Most of these titles seem to be in the sci-fi genre. Some thrillers, too. If lost, please return the card to the library. Dial 005-02-55212. One, one. Or visit us at Moreau Street, 78, Jamrock. Business hours, 900 to 1800. Good. We should give them a call from my kinema. See if we can learn anything about Billy Mejean. Good idea. There was plenty of information here to go by. There's some tear, an empty cigarette package, and a crumpled kebab wrapper in the trash bin. Two empty bottles of Tallulah vodka and a can of black potent porter is all you find. No, there's more in there. Livis strawberry liquor, plus some Pilsner bottles too. Better not pick them up. They seem unhygienic. A tragedy. He shakes his head with genuine sadness. Whoever tossed it here was a heavy smoker. The brand name reads Red Astra. Red Astra is the black market version of Astra cigarettes, known for their high tar content. Now, this makes partying look bad. Still, 
Don't let it sway you. You're responsible. You see traces of mayonnaise and ketchup on it, as well as a tomato wedge. The wrapper reads, Shish Kebab Revachol. It's no older than a day or two. No mold yet. It's hard to concentrate in the smell. The sea air brings some relief. someone unless you're out of change you hear the tone the machine is inoperable calling still calling this feels wrong should you be doing this end of tone someone picks up Pierre, is that you Pierre? Say you're not Pierre. That seems like a better idea. You don't know why. No, this is not Pierre. Do you have any news about Pierre? Who is Pierre? He's my sister's grandson. He used to visit me as a lad. Fine young man. But who are you then? A salesman of some sort? Modern goods are rubbish and I can't afford them anyhow. It's a shame what you did to our country. I'm not a salesman. I was just calling a random number. You somehow ran with it. This is because we are bred to be leaders. I can hear the common or mixed background from your voice. I just so wanted it to be Pierre. Have a pleasant evening, prankster. Disconnect tone. Calling. Still calling. Again? Seriously? Someone with a masculine voice picks up. Hello, Gerard speaking. Hello, Gerard. Technically speaking, you're electricity. No, what you are is a surprise. Get his wife on the phone. Hey, Gerard. Get your wife on me, will ya? Who is this? It's Pierre. Now put her on. I don't like waiting. Who the fuck do you think you are talking to me like that? I'm the guy who's fucking your wife, Gerard. Now put her on before I lose my patience. Just tell me what's going on here. Bien! Come here! The sounds are muffled. You can make out two people. A man and a woman called Bien. They're talking to each other in agitated voices. There's a shuffle of feet. Children, maybe. Amid the howling in the wire, you make out a woman's voice with a thick Samaran accent. Girard, Girard, this is a joke. Someone is making a joke. More shouting. You're pretty sure you hear a man saying, fuck, several times. Then, the crackle in the phone line gets violently louder, like the surf breaking. You hear a faint thuck. You could swear you're hearing furniture falling over. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep fucking your wife, Gerard. What the hell are you doing? What? I'm just having a bit of fun. What's the big deal? Big deal? This has lowered his opinion of you, but only a little. Let's just go. I've had enough of this phone booth. Date of birth generator. You were born in the year 07, in the last year of the commune of Revachon, right before it fell in the old military hospital on the ground floor where people usually came to die during a snowstorm. The revolution had about one year left to go, and the fires were still burning bright. 
there were explosions in the blizzard. This was 44 years ago. You are 44 years old. The bloating might never leave your face, but beneath it, you still have some years. You still have some hope. Take a longer look at yourself and how you're reflected in that slick chemical rainbow. What do you see? Metaphor. It's always metaphor. Some kind of metaphor for me? This is more important than you. That's the blood of industry you see before you. The runoff from Coal City, further down the coast. The engines of fortune once roared here. Great wealth poured into Revachol, the Delta, as did smoke, waste, sickness, life. What happened? The engines stopped. The West Revacholian industrial base was dismantled after the war. Now, extinguished coke furnaces dot the landscape, a landscape despoiled by industry. Filth. This needs environmental action now. I don't see the problem. Revo Show moved on to the service industry. Get with the times, yo! Right. Here's some advice that's good for business and life. Never fight a losing battle. I'm not even going to argue with you. hasn't been opened in a long while. You see a handle. What is this thing anyway? It's military. A service depot of some sort. Used to service what? The washerwoman mentioned a depot up the coast. She said it was for moving ammo and cargo across the bay. This might be it. at your feet. Looks like the same one you saw Morel set before. Same mesh, same wiring. The reeds sway in the coastal breeze. They seem to be waiting for something. The wind picks up here, near the Cape's end, surrounding the narrow strip of land from three cardinal directions. It's cold for this time of year. Locusts are crawling around in the trap, confused but uneaten. You see no carnivorous reed phasmid gorging on them. Big surprise. Anyway, one down, three to go. It'll be on the next one, surely. Surely. Anyway, the air is nice and fresh here. tight how can we get in there we don't get in there what do you mean we get into like everywhere frankly you're just going to have to accept the fact that you can't get in through every single door no no 
We've gotten into every door thus far. That's what we do. We open doors. We're cops. That's our perk. Even Everard knew that's a part of our MO. But that's who I am. Who we are. Yeah, I understand you. I like opening doors as much as the next guy. But this one is simply beyond repair and we don't have the resources needed to open it. Relax. No one's hiding in there. If we can't open it, others can't either. And thus they can't get in. At least you can think about opening it. About doors in general. They are, after all, fundamental to your life. Perhaps something useful would come from this. More than twice your height stands shut in front of you. The rectangular sea-worn ornamentation appears in stark contrast to the padlock, carelessly drilled into the wood. Nothing happens, only the sound of the padlock rattling against the door. I don't think that's going to work. High above, the wind wraps the church in its rush, cold and wet from the ocean bay. It parts around the massive keel-shaped roof, like a test tunnel washing both sides. The way it has done for 340 years, the wind keeps its distance. So should you. What is this feeling? There is a hole in my heart. The lieutenant looks at the padlock. He didn't hear you asking. You were quiet enough. The carving on the door is block-like and angular, like the church itself. Two large beams shoot downwards, sinking into the wood before they reach the threshold. The surface is smooth from the wind, but moist to the touch. Feels exceptional. 300 tons of pine would fit together seamlessly. It's old too, cut and carved many centuries ago. This cheap-looking padlock is sturdily built. It shackles together a hasp and a staple screwed into the wooden door. The lock is adorned with a yellow sticker. It'll be easier to break the staple than the lock. Also, that sticker is interesting, somehow. You see a yellow circle with two X's and a big curve below them that looks like a mouth. You're pretty sure you haven't seen it before, but what the symbol depicts is clear enough. A smiling dead guy. The curve makes it smile, and the X's make it dead. There is something blindingly modern about this symbol. Its modernness puts to shame everything you've seen before. What makes it so modern? It's the contrast between the cherry, chemical yellow, and the rigor mortis. As if the cherry guy didn't know he was dead, or the dead guy didn't care that he was. Either way, you get the sense the forces of future are at work here. These forces of future have chosen to pick something that reminds you of you. Have you seen this symbol before? He takes off his glasses and uses a blue handkerchief to thoroughly wipe them clean before inspecting the sticker. Then he looks up, pauses and replies. No. What does it look like to you? Looks like a dead man smiling. Suggests junior delinquency. Okay, what is junior delinquency? For Revachtol Z aussi, the moral intern defined junior delinquents as minors between the ages of 10 and 16 who have committed an act in violation of the law. These acts aren't called crimes as they would be for adults. Crimes committed by minors are called delinquent acts. This was part of your officer's exams. He feels sorry for you. For him as a lieutenant, it would be demeaning to have someone recite terms from the officer's exam. What is suggestive of junior delinquency here? I haven't seen that sticker before, and I'm not a youth. I agree. It's very modern. But does the chitty guy not know he's dead? Or does the dead guy not care that he is? What is the source of the irony here? That level of conceptual thinking is not part of my skill set. 
The padlock passes through a staple that's been hastily attached to the wood. Closer inspection reveals that one of the screws is not a screw at all, but a nail. The work has been done recently and is unprofessional, to say the least. Should you want to get through, it might be easier to just pry the whole thing off. This is where Mr. Prybar comes in handy. Maybe we should circle the building first and look for another way. The building has seen enough mistreatment. There is a touch of guilt in his voice. Should we start with that kick drum coming from the ice? I heard the sound before. Yes, the pulsing bass. A sure sign of junior delinquency. Somewhere east of here. There's something on the sea ice there. There's nothing like the sound of a sticker unpeeling. Now it's stuck to your thumb. Looks like today was a gold star day. 